Hey guys, Mike here from Lunch Money Comics. Today I'm in Plainville, Connecticut at the monthly CliffsCon. It's an awesome show, and I'm here looking for some very specific comic books. Let's see if I have any luck. I would have thought that would have come out. And this one had, this one I had. Did you so, see? No. I, I never did anything with writing on the No, no, no. I just did the writing again to see. Okay. I, I know. I know. Yeah. I'm just saying that. No, no, I know. Well, I was even telling him what I had a conversation so close. Almost. Always tie it up. <laughs> Some of those at my table, but oh, yeah? they're all that. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all good stuff. Yeah, that's all DC. Yeah, that's actually really good. Yeah, that's all good. Yeah, that's all good. Yeah, that's all good. Yeah, that's I could always take a picture in December. Oh, definitely, yep. Alright guys, I found a couple of the comic books that were on my list, but I didn't find the big book I was trying to track down. There's always next show. Still, it's always fun here at CliffsCon. I can't wait to go home and show you guys what I got. So there you go guys, that was the always awesome CliffCon in Plainville, Connecticut. It's a comic show that happens on the last Sunday of every single month, and I always look forward to going. Now, I mentioned in that footage I was there looking for some very specific comic books, and while I didn't find all of them, the awesome comic books at this show aren't my favorite reason for going. It's actually the people. Whenever I go, I bump into familiar faces, friends, vendors I see all the time. I get to chat with them, network, talk about future opportunities and shows. And I just love the small community feel 
of the show. Everyone knows each other. Everyone's in a great mood. It's always a fun time. And while I was there, I found out about two upcoming comic book shows. So before I talk about the comic books I got at this CliffCon, I want to very quickly tell you about these two upcoming shows in Connecticut, because if you live in the Northeastern United States, you might be very interested to hear about them. The first one is the next CliffCon, which just like all the other ones is on the last Sunday of the month on May 28th, 2023. However, unlike all those other ones, instead of being at this small VFW in Plainville, Connecticut, this is one of their big shows they do, which is at the Double Tree Hotel in Bristol, Connecticut. Should be a nice big show, and I hope to be there. The other one is called the Three Men in a Basement Comic Book Swap. And the reason I know about it is one of my viewers tipped me off to it on Instagram, shout out to John, and told me about this amazing show. So Three Men in a Basement are a YouTube channel of three guys talking about comic books and all sorts of other cool things. But they also do a comic book show once a year, and by all accounts, it's awesome. Not only do they have comic book vendors there, but it's a comic swap. People bring comic books to trade with one another, to hang out, chat, have a good old time, but also the atmosphere is great. There's a DJ, there are food trucks, there are drinks, and in years past, they've even had some YouTubers there. Not me, other YouTubers that are far more popular that have been doing this far longer than me. And um, I'm not gonna mention which ones because I'm not sure if they're gonna be there this year, but trust me, if you watch my channel, you definitely know who some of these guys are. So I was already thinking of going, I thought it sounded awesome, and then when I was at this past CliffCon, I bumped into all three of the three guys in a basement. I introduced myself, I told them I was interested in going to the show and asked if I could promote it on their channel. They said, absolutely, please do so. So that's what I'm doing right now. So when does this amazing show happen? Tomorrow as in the day after this video premieres. It's on May 20th, 2023. I apologize for the late notice, but it's the best I could do to get the word out on my channel. So if you're interested in going to either one of these shows, I'll make sure to put a link down in the description to all the information, where, when, and how to get to them. And guys, if you go to either one of them, there's a good chance you'll bump it to me there as well. I'll also put a link down there to the YouTube channel of Three Men in a Basement. Definitely check them out and sub them up. So before I show you guys the comic books I got at this past CliffCon, if you like this sort of stuff and you want to support the channel, please head on down, hit that like button, share my channel with others, consider subscribing if you haven't already, always leave a comment, I love reading them, and of course you can follow me on Instagram under Lunch Money Comics IG. Okay, so let's talk about the comic books I got at the show. Believe it or not guys, I only ended up with three comic books, but I have a couple of bonus ones to show you guys afterwards. Let's start with this one. This is Green Lantern number 50, volume three from 1994. And I love this book because so many significant things happen in it. But for me to tell you about it, um, I'm gonna kind of have to spoil it. So if you're someone who's planning on reading this whole Emerald Twilight storyline, which I recommend you do, by the way, um, I'm gonna be spoiling some parts, so you've been warned. So let's start with issue number 48, which is the first part of this Emerald Twilight storyline. I've actually talked about it on my channel in the past, but that book is usually known as the first cameo appearance of Kyle Rayner, who ends up being the next Green Lantern. However, Kyle Rayner only shows up on the last page. It's really a Hal Jordan story. So in that storyline, uh, it starts off with Coast City, Hal Jordan's beloved Coast City, a smoldering crater. The city's been destroyed by the villain Mongol, and Hal Jordan is sitting in this crater, despondent. He's in grief. He's in mourning because he lost the city and all the people he loves. And in that grief, he uses the ring to start making constructs of people from his past, starting with his parents. And then eventually, he basically recreates all of Coast City, including all the people in it, including his childhood sweetheart, who he has a conversation with. Well, at the end of this story, under that book, number 48, one of the Guardians of Oa comes down as a projection and says, Hal Jordan, you broke the rules. You're using your ring for personal gain. We're going to take your power back. And he flips out and says, personal gain? This is personal loss. I've lost everything. I'm mourning. I'm in grief. And the Guardian says, too bad. I'm taking the ring away. Uh, Green Lantern destroys that image of the Guardian and says, you know what? I'm going to Oa and I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. He shoots off in outer space as a green streak. And you see the brief uh, one panel of Kyle Rayner kind of like, oh, what was that? So the next issue, number 49, um, Hal Jordan starts heading to Oa to basically to fight them. And they start sending every Green Lantern after him to stop him. And one by one, he beats every single one of them and takes their rings. In fact, issue number 49 has a fantastic cover of him holding uh, all the rings on his fingers. Uh, one of the people at the Comic-Con actually called it <laughs> the Tom Brady cover with all the rings. And uh, yeah, so he beats all the Green Lanterns, which finally brings us to issue 
number 50. So what happens in this book? Well, the Guardians, seeing that they have no other choice to stop this enraged Hal Jordan, they send their final uh, ace up their sleeve. It's Sinestro. They give Sinestro a ring and send him after Hal Jordan. They have this brutal fight, which ends in Hal Jordan killing Sinestro with his bare hands. He then kills his friend Kilowog. He walks into the central battery on Oa and walks out as the villain Parallax, a villain mantle he would wear for like 10 years. Um, he destroys all the rings. The last one is in pieces. The final guardians put those pieces back together and they give them to a young man named Kyle Rayner who becomes the next Green Lantern. And he was a Green Lantern for years when I was growing up, right? So that actually stuck for a long time. Hal Jordan was the villain Parallax, although only years later do they say that that Parallax entity was a separate being, like you saw in that horrible Ryan Reynolds uh, movie, uh, but it was his new um, persona, basically. So all of that, right? Death of Sinestro, Death of Kilowog, first full Kyle Rayner as Green Lantern, Hal Jordan as a villain, and a glow-in-the-dark cover for $5, guys. This book and this whole storyline is awesome. If you are a Green Lantern fan, if you're a DC fan, or even if you're just a comic book fan, guys, I think all three of those issues, 48, 49, and 50, are absolutely worth picking up. I actually own several copies of this book, but this one's in a really high grade, and I'm always happy to pick one of these up for five bucks. So next up, we have another cheap comic book, which might give you some insight into what kind of comic books I was looking for at this show. This is DC Comics Presents number 24 from 1980, and this features a team up between Superman and dead man so i say it all the time on my channel i am a marvel fan primarily but i do like dc characters but the ones i like aren't the big ones they're not the supermans and the batmans and the wonder womans they're the weird ones they are the specters and the swamp things and the constantines and the dead man basically characters that are usually associated with justice league dark they're basically a team uh, of superheroes that are affiliated with supernatural the occult things like that fighting much darker and more sinister threats well, ever since getting, you know, the first Silver Age appearance of the Spectre uh, months ago and the first appearance of Dead Man a few weeks ago, I'll tell you guys, I've been going head first down the rabbit hole of Justice League Dark in these darker DC characters. I've been picking them up left and right, and uh, I wasn't intending to find this book. I didn't even know about this book until I saw it in a back issue bin, but it was $3 and it was totally worth picking up for that price. Now, this segues quite nicely into my next book, which I had every intention of picking up. And it is this. This is the Spectre number one from 1967. And this is the first issue of Spectre's own self-titled series. Now, despite the fact that the Spectre was around since the Golden Age, he basically was on a hiatus for 20 years until he appeared in the Silver Age in DC Showcase Presents number 60. I have a couple copies back there. And it was followed up by the very next year um, with this right here, Spectre number one in 1967, written by Gardner Fox, art by Murphy Anderson. And uh, I've been looking at this book all over the place, guys. I see it at every comic book show I've gone to. And I've seen specifically this book at CliffCon at the same vendor multiple times. Uh, I could just never pull the trigger on it because, you know, it's a dark cover. It shows all the color breaks. Well, this was the time I couldn't live without it. You know, I didn't have many books in my hand. I didn't want to go home empty handed. So it was on sale for $27. And this was the time I finally pulled the trigger. Uh, it's probably a 4.0. That's what the uh, the vendor said it was. And I think that's about right. I think it's a really cool presenting book. A little bit of text up here in the trade dress. But I think it's awesome looking. And it's a great addition to my dark DC character collection. And it's going to look really nice side by side with that DC showcase so this was sort of like the best book I got on the day. I only got three comic books, right? So this was sort of like the prize. And uh, I could totally end this video right now. But I don't want to because I have more to say about these darker DC characters as well as a couple more books that I want to share with you. So because I've been liking these characters more and more, I recently found out about the animated film Justice League Dark. It's from 2017 and I saw it on HBO. I had to check it out. Dead Man was in it. You know, I was really into Dead Man at the time. So I started watching this movie and uh, I knew all the characters in this movie, except for one. There was one character I saw that I was completely perplexed. Uh, they called her Black Orchid. Uh, I thought Black Orchid was like a human, right? Like a girl, a fighter. But in this movie, she was like the uh, magical embodiment of Constantine's House of Mystery. So I started reading about this character and sure enough, that was like a different take on the character just for that movie. But I started reading about this character and she originated in the Bronze Age and for a long time, she didn't really have an origin or really a backstory or even like a civilian identity until Neil Gaiman wrote a whole series on her in the late 80s. And even then, you know, it's a mantle that's been picked up by 
uh, multiple different people with different power sets. Sometimes she's, you know, super strong and flies. Other times she has plant-based powers. Sometimes she disguises. Sometimes she's a shapeshifter. Either way, I was intrigued. And then I saw her first appearance was in uh, Adventure Comics Presents number 428. So I was looking at ClipCon for this book and I saw her second and third appearances. Uh, I think you saw in the, some of the footage there. And I asked everybody and people would tell me like, oh man, they, they just sold one or they can't find it or maybe they have one at home for the next time they see me. Sure, all right, I'll, I'll get it next time. But then I drove home guys and I was thinking about it and I just, I really wanted this book. And uh, I'm not gonna say I'm obsessed. I'm gonna say I'm driven. Whenever I set my mind to something, um, I kind of go at it 110%, whether it's collecting certain comic books that I like or starting a YouTube channel. I just go full bore. I got home, went onto eBay, um, you know, put a whole bunch of these, you know, first appearance of Black Orchid um, on my watch list. A few hours later, several of those sellers gave me some low offers. Um, I took the best condition one, and within a couple of days, surprisingly fast, I had it in my hand. So here it is, Adventure Comics number 428 presenting the Black Orchid. It's from 1973, awesome Bob Oskner cover, showing the title character right there in her superhero debut on this really cool sort of horror Halloween uh, vibe cover here. Uh, and yeah, and like I said, she has many different like power sets over time. Uh, in this iteration here, she just seems to have like super strength, flight, durability, and she's like a master of disguise. Um, but in later iterations, she actually can shape shift. And Neil Gaiman, when he filled in her backstory, basically said she was a a uh, human plant hybrid uh, associated with like you know the green and swamp thing kind of like poison ivy and that, that was actually the first time like in 1988 you find out who the heck she is and she's given a name at all I think it's kind of funny they say this is her origin issue there's no origin in here whatsoever you wouldn't get an origin for like 15 years uh, still guys I know it's not exactly the version that I saw in that Justice League dark movie but it's still a very cool looking comic book and a very cool looking character and uh, listen I know I didn't get it at the comic book show but when you, when you want something bad enough, you have to have it. I cheated and went on eBay, but I finally have it in my hand. And I could totally end this video right here, but I'm not gonna, because I have some more comic books I wanna show you. So I'm gonna invite you to go down this rabbit hole a little bit further with me in some other Justice League Dark characters I've recently picked up. So next up, we have another awesome comic book featuring a first appearance of a Justice League Dark character. This time I got it at a comic book shop. I was up in Greenfield, Massachusetts at His and Her Comics. Uh, the owner was planning to have a 20% off sale for a free comic book day. He was willing to extend the sale to me a few days early. So when I saw this book when I was there, I absolutely had to have it. What am I talking about? It's this. This is The Demon number 1 from 1972. Art and story by the incomparable Jack Kirby. And the story behind this book, uh, not only within its pages, but also its publication history, are very, very interesting. So let's start with that publication history. It's the early 70s. Horror books are really hot at the time. DC asks their all-star Jack Kirby to come up with a horror-themed character, a superhero. So he does. He comes up with this idea of Etrigan the Demon. He makes this book here, and of course it sells like hotcakes. The story is very well received. DC asks him to do the entire rest of the series, and very reluctantly, Jack Kirby has to put aside some of his other pet projects, like The New Gods, to write this story. Still, very well received. I've had friends advocate for this story and this character for years. So the story within the pages is this. Uh, Merlin, uh, in centuries ago, you know, we're talking medieval, you know, England, um, is under control of this demon named Etrigan, and he bonds this demon to a knight of the round table named Jason Blood. Um, this gives him the power to switch back and forth between, you know, a knight of the round table and a demon, but also um, gives him immortality and lets him survive all the way to modern times, in which case in modern DC Comics, he is a well-known demonologist. And despite the fact that Etrigan is a demon from hell, um, he always finds himself fighting on the side of good, or at least usually does, not only alongside characters like Justice League Dark, but also other more heroic DC characters. Um, I used to stick my nose up to this character. I didn't really get him. He was a demon that spoke in rhyme. He does. He speaks in rhymes. Um, but once I saw him in that Justice League Dark movie, I was like, oh, I get it now. That's actually a pretty cool idea. Uh, it made me very intrigued with the character and about reading the series. So I was very happy to pick this up. I got it for $75. It's in pretty high grade for what it is. And I think it's a great price for that. So uh, that's it, guys. Another first edition to my Justice League Dark characters. Still going down this rabbit hole. And um, I should absolutely end the video right there. But I'm not. I'm not. You're going to go down the rabbit hole a little bit further with me, guys, on this obsession. Sorry. Driven. I'm driven. I'm driven. Uh, because I have one more book that I want to show you guys that sort of ties all of these titles and all of these characters together. So, 
Technically, the first appearance of the Justice League Dark team was in Justice League Dark number one in 2011. It was one of the new 52 series that came out, and for a lot of people, that was the first time like this team was called the Justice League Dark. But remember, a lot of these characters have been around since the Bronze, Silver, and even the Gold Age, and many of these characters had interacted many times over the previous decades. So depending on how you look at it, you can see some iteration of this team forming earlier. That's where this next book comes into play. So this is also free comic book day. This time I was at Holy Moly Comics in Northampton, Massachusetts. I saw this book on the wall. They had it on consignment and it was $25. Again, way down the rabbit hole at this point. Head first, guys. I had to get this book. What book am I talking about? It's this. This is Swamp Thing number 49, written, of course, by Alan Moore from 1986. Art on the inside by Stan Walk. Uh, cover art by Steve Bissett, showing this awesome uh, Swamp Thing, obviously, his face. And uh, this is, for a lot of people, considered the first appearance of the Justice League Dark Team. So let me explain what happens in this book. So Constantine, him and Swamp Thing are going up against this primordial dark evil, right? Basically from the beginning of time, you know, that old chestnut, and they know it's gonna be a really tough fight, so they part ways to go recruit a team of superheroes that are tied, you know, to the supernatural and the occult. And, uh, and who do they recruit? Well, they recruit such names as Dead Man and Etrigan the Demon and Dr. Fate and Zatanna and the Phantom Stranger and yes, even the Spectre. Because of that, many people consider this the first appearance of the Justice League Dark Team. They are assembled in this book, and in number 50, you see them in their full glory fighting side by side. Um, I understand why some people might say this isn't because they're not actually named, but for my money, guys, that's clearly the Justice League Dark Team uh, in the iteration that we know, especially when you have Constantine and Swamp Thing leading it. So because of that, I had to have this book. I thought it was a great price for $25, guys, and um, I could end this video right here. No, I'm gonna. I'm gonna end this video right here. No, honestly, guys, I'm pretty excited about all my new pickups um, and this new obsession that I have. Sorry, not an obsession. No, it's an obsession, isn't it? Let me know down in the comments if you think I'm obsessed with these Justice League Dark characters. Uh, I think these are fantastic pickups, guys. Um, you know, it's funny being a collector who's been, you know, collecting comic books for a long time. You know, whereas like, you know, Marvel is my bread and butter. I love the X Men. It's fun even when you get older to kind of like change your taste, right? And start looking at other titles and other things you're into. And man, it is refreshing and it feels great. And for those of you who have told me on my, uh, in my comments that I do way too much Marvel and way too much X-Men, um, I hope you at least enjoyed me going down this DC rabbit hole. I think all these comic books are awesome. So definitely head on down to the comments, guys, and let me know what you think of my new obsession. Let me know which of these comic books uh, you like the best. Let me know if any of these characters are your personal favorite or you read any of these or if you've seen that Justice League Dark movie and what you think of the entire concept of the team. That, that's it, guys. In the meantime, I hope you keep hunting for strange and unusual characters in strange and unusual places. Thank you all so very much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.